Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very pleased to have with me today Dr. Catherine Joffrey uh, to tell us all about her book just published by Stanford University Press in 2023, titled Outrage, the Arts and the Creation of Modernity, which is fascinating. So this book looks at a key time period where a whole bunch of things are changing in terms of industry, in terms of politics. This book helps us understand that during sort of the mid 1800s to roughly 1930s, um, alongside all those other transformations, there's a lot happening in arts and culture as well, um, both in terms of cool new things being produced, but also debates about them, debates about what the status of women is, debate about what is art and who gets to decide. And Kathy, in this book, dives into these cultural battles to help us understand what we think of as art today, how some of the decisions were made, and what links we can maybe draw between today's culture wars and what was happening during this time period. So, Kathy, thank you so much for being on the podcast to tell us all about this. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you. Before we dive into the book and especially your six wonderful case studies, I'm wondering if you could introduce yourself a little bit and explain why you decided to write this. Sure. Um, my name is Kathy Jaffray. I am a very, very recently retired professor of sociology from Colorado College in the United States. And um, this really, the book comes from two different places. One is sort of my academic areas of interest I've been looking at. I study um, the sociology of culture and I do network analysis. And so a lot of my work has been looking at social networks and things like um, creativity, how creativity happens in social networks. Um, so so the study of creativity has been a huge part of what I'm, um, what I've been doing for years now as a as a scholar. And I think creativity is really interesting because we tend to think of it as this completely positive thing. Oh, everyone would love to be more creative, isn't creativity wonderful? But when we actually look at it, we find that it, it's it's instead rather fraught. Um, people say they want creativity, but in fact, we have a lot of negative associations with creativity. Um, there's a great study actually. Um, by Jack John Callo, who's a professor at Illinois at University of Illinois at, at Urbana-Champaign, where he found using some of the same techniques that people use to discover unconscious bias, that the words most closely associated with creativity were agony, poison, and vomit. So I think that that you know we actually have a lot of negative feelings about creativity. So it's I find it a very fascinating study. Um, but then the second thing that happened to me was actually I was sitting in a used bookstore when bookstores used to exist um, with my children. I was waiting for them. They were in the children's section. I was just sitting in a chair in the poetry section um, because that's where the chair was. And uh, there was a book on the shelf in front of me. So I just picked it up while I was waiting. It was a biography of Emily Dickinson. And I opened it to a random place. And I found that there was this, um, there was a passage about these really scathing, scathing reviews um, that her poetry had received when it first went into the world. And I thought, huh, this is, this is interesting. This is someone who'd been made sort of into um, a, a classic part of the canon and in a sense sort of into this cultural spinach. It's like it, she's so tame, in, or at least in my imagination, she seemed so tame. And to read that the uproar really that surrounded the publication of her poems when they first came out was kind of shocking to me. Um, so I started reading um, just at, and around my house and people would say, what's the deal with you and Emily Dickinson? What's going on? I said, I don't know. I'm just fascinated by this. And then there were other, some, all of the other studies basically came from the same thing. I was reading things just for my interest and pleasure and discovered this pattern that kept happening over and over again. Um, so that's really, that's how I decided to write this book. I think it's therefore no surprise that um, Emily Dickinson's poems are one of your case studies, given yes. that background. <laughs> right. Would you mind telling us what the other five are and a bit about how you chose them? Sure. Well, I start, I go basically from 1847 um, to 1937, and I start with the novels of the Bronte sisters. Um, and once again, this is the, it's fascinating because the Brontes, I think, have we see them as being very tamed as these sort of these spinster sisters living this um, living this very secluded life. 
Um, but when their books came out, they were they were greeted. Actually, it's a fascinating story. They were greeted initially um, with great approval because they were writing under male pen names. Um, but when they found out it was women who were writing these books, just outrage ensued. So I look at the novels of the Bronte sisters. Um, I look at the paintings of the Impressionists. Once again, something that's in the canon on the top of every chocolate box. Um, but the, the reviews that came out when they first appeared were truly... Um, you know, some of the things that I found most fascinating was how ugly people considered uh, the Impressionist paintings, really, really ugly. Um, Dickinson, of course, I look at the Rite of Spring, the premiere in Paris in 1913, which is so famous because a riot broke out on the opening night, which is not something, riots are not something that I normally associate with the ballet. What could be going on in a ballet? The people would actually start punching each other in the audience of it seemed um, really fascinating to me. Um, James Joyce's Ulysses, which I, I thought was so interesting because it went in a different way than the sort of physical violence. It really took things into the courts and those um, legal decisions. So I thought that was really fascinating. And finally, my last um, battle, my last case study is Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God, um, which is one of my all-time favorite novels. It's, it's, um, it's really brilliant. Um, and that was interesting to me because it really split the African-American community, the black intelligentsia in the United States, into different camps about what was she doing and what was she up to. So it really intellectually was also fascinating because it really brought into this que- brought up this question of legitimation. Who gets to decide what's good? What's this art for? Who's supposed to be doing it? What are they supposed to be doing? it? And also Zora Neale Hurston is, a, a, is just, um, she's so much fun to read about. Out. She just really is. Um, so what the, those are the studies. Those are the six case studies, but they were all chosen um, because they are things that are now in the canon that are, are considered classics. And at the time, the, the reaction to them was um, outrage, was really outrage, not just dismissal, not just incomprehension, but people wanted to destroy this art and destroy the people who made it. And again, thinking kind of from today's perspective, it's really interesting, as you said, sort of, well, these are part of the canon. We, we, we're we not outraged by them now. We teach them in our <laughs> secondary schools right. um, all over the place. But as you detail in the book, um, people were outraged by them. And they also saw them in a lot of ways as subversive, right? That was one of the reasons there was so much emotion around it. It wasn't just like, oh, this is bad. It's like, no, no, this is dangerous in some exactly. sort of way. Um which was super intriguing because there's a lot going on there, which helpfully you uh, have a nice little map about that takes us through all of those components and makes it all make sense. So could you take us through that conceptual map, please? Um, Maybe through one of those examples? Sure. Um, So I want to use the example of the Brontes because I think it's it's so clear cut um, what was going on. I think I want to start with with the idea of hegemony, right? These hegemonic ideas, these ideas that are transmitted through the culture, but that are oppressed oppressive um, to some group that oppress or subordinate some group, but are accepted as right, normal, natural, including by members of that group. So I think when we look at, you know, 1847, um, when Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights were published, um, at the end of 1847, we think about what was the view of women? What was going on with women? And there were interesting things going on about women's changing place in the society. Um, so we, but those hegemonic processes, so we have, this is at the time when you know even Shakespeare was being boulderized because um, those pernicious ideas that would get into people's heads that women and children, which was you know one category, not two, um, shouldn't be reading and they shouldn't be they certainly shouldn't be writing. And if they are writing, they should be writing um, sort of namby pamby is the word that that Charlotte Bronte uses, sort of namby pamby stuff that's not going to have too much power in it. It's not going to quite frankly, be very good um, because sort of having power in writing was going to be something that um, was going to be so disruptive to women. It was basically going to destroy society. So these hegemonic ideas are there. So 
my map. I start with the subversive art because I do think the reason this art um, caused so much outrage was because it was subversive. What was it subverting? These hegemonic ideas about who could make art, what kind of art should be made, what is good art, what is bad art. Simultaneous to this, we also have two things that are really um, uh, important changes in society, and they go hand in hand. One is the rise of mass media. We start getting the penny press so that people can now get newspapers, they can get magazines. And the other thing that goes right along with that is a rise in literacy rates. So during the course of the 19th century, we see literacy rates in Britain, for example, going from about mm, 30, 40% of the population being literate to at the end of the 19th century, almost 100%, right? So there's this enormous explosion in literacy um, at the same time, there's all there is the rise of the penny press, cheaper ways of making paper, all of those things, cheaper transportation methods, um, mean that suddenly there there is a, a hunger for reading material, and that is being filled. That hunger for reading material is being filled um, with the with this press that is is being transformed into something. The publishers of the press realize that outrage is very very good for the bottom bottom line. So there are these public discussions in the media. Their critics now arise, people who are talking about these books in public. At the same time, so this verse of art is going hand in hand with the public discussion in the media, with these disruptions of hegemonic processes, and also with battles over the power of cultural legitimation. Who gets to decide? what is good, what is bad, what is appropriate, what counts as art, what instead is pornography. Who gets to decide that? Who gets to set the rules of the game? Because the person who sets the rules of the game can set them to benefit themselves, of course. So if all writing written by women, for example, can be relegated to the second class um, level, then that keeps uh, women in their place. It keeps women in their place. So my my little map shows that the subversive art plays a role in bringing about these battles over legitimation, um, in disrupting these hegemonic processes, and in and in bringing about these public discussions in the media. Um, the hegemonic processes are disrupted merely by being questioned. One of the things that gives hegemony its power is that it's not questioned, it's accepted. And once it starts being questioned, it, its its foundations are very rocky. So we see, for example, with the Brontes, the idea was that, um, first of all, women couldn't write with power. Women couldn't write. They don't have the ability to do it. But second of all, that the content of the Brontes novels were subversive because the idea was that women were asexual. Women had no sexual desires. They had no sexual needs. So the fact that these books were in many ways about women's sexual desires, women's sexual passions, written from a female point of view, um, when the books first came out under the pen names Kerr Ellis and Acton Bell, it was assumed that they were written by men. And actually, the first reviews were quite glowing. Um, you know, Jane Eyre was, was very well received until the secret of the authorship leaked out. Once the, the reviewers figured out that these were not men writing about women, but women writing about women, that's when we really got the turn. And the and the reviews just became scathing and they became scathing. So people said things like, oh, Charlotte Bronte, if she'd ever had a baby, if she were married and had a baby, she wouldn't have written such a horrible book as Jane Eyre that's so vulgar and vicious and grotesque. She wouldn't have been able to do it. If only she'd ever had a baby in her arms, she wouldn't have been able to do this. Um, so they were really attacked. They were accused of being fallen women, um, which is the thing that pretty much every woman in the entire book that I write about is accused of being at one time or another. Um, but it was really, there was enormous outrage. But at that same time, that outrage shows that, that this was a, a tender point for this society. It was, a, it was a moment where women's roles were really transforming and the ideas around what women could do and what women could be were transforming. There, it was a breaking point. Um, and just by existing, the Bronte's novels prove that women are capable of powerful writing, that women do 
in fact have passion and desire. Um, so they touched on a sore point right at the point when the society itself was grappling with that sort of issue. So my argument is the outrage and the emerging modernity are in a are in a relationship with each other. The outrage in some ways um, brings to the fore the questioning of these hegemonic ideas and so therefore allows new ideas to come in. Um, but the very fact that the society was changing and was at this sort of vulnerable moment of change was part of the reason why there was so much outrage directed at these particular works of art. Hmm. Thank you for taking us through that. I think that is a really clear cut example. Um, given kind of the fact that this is, in many cases, this is already sort of a sore point, right? It's not like the work of art creates the sore point. Um, how much is the outrage, do you think, a product of the audience misunderstanding the artist's point or intention? Is that one of the things going on here or not? Well, I'm not sure. I think that there are a couple of things going on. One is that the audience was understanding exactly what was going on, at least at some level, um, by which I mean that even when uh, critics or audiences said, I don't get it, there was something about it that they were getting, this sore point they were getting. And a great example of that is the Impressionists, where uh, where people came to laugh at the Impressionists. The, the people who went to the first Impressionist shows, um, they came to jeer, they came to make fun of this work. Um, the critics made fun of it. But the thing that came up over and over again, the word that was used over and over again was vulgar, how vulgar all of this was. Because if we think of the time, art was the academic art that was in the salon, right? And it was heroes and it was biblical scenes and it was massive paintings that were painted for the elite, for the um, aristocracy, for the, for the only the very top of the of the social hierarchy. The Impressionists were painting scenes of everyday life, um, people, you know, uh, dancing at, at uh, cafes on the riverbank, um, people boating, uh, people just walking on the boulevards. Um, and, and they were also, importantly, they were making these paintings small enough to fit in an apartment. You didn't have to have a palace to own one of these paintings. So there was a, there was a, a sort of uproar about how vulgar, how ugly all of this was. And, you know, Degas' little ballet dancer really came in for it. Oh, these ballet dancers, it's so vulgar. How could anyone show such things as these horrible, horrible ballet dancers are so ugly? Um, and they, and a lot of people said, we don't understand what's going on here. And one of the questions that they um, say is, we don't understand who would put this in their house. We don't understand this. They understood exactly who would put them in their house, which was the rising middle class. That's who would put them in their house. And that's who were buying these pictures and who were enjoying these pictures. So that claim not to understand is a way of saying, um, I refuse to understand what's going on here. Because if I understand what's going on here, then I have to understand a change that's happening in my society. And that change is frightening to me. If the rising middle class are buying art, then what's to separate this, these, this, um, the bourgeois from the, from the elite? What's to keep them in their place? If they can buy art, like we can buy art and they can buy, you know, dresses that look like our dresses um, and they can live in apartments uh, that are, that are spacious and nice. How, how can we demonstrate that they are less, lesser, that they are less than we are? How can the elite say, oh, well, you're not as good as we are? Um, and so they, so I think there was not so much that critics didn't understand or that some parts of the population didn't understand what was going on. They understood exactly what was going on, but they refused, on, at least on a conscious level, to understand this. They refused to, to see what was going on. I think we see the same thing with James Joyce's Ulysses, a, a famously difficult book to read, of course, but the idea that was incomprehensible um, itself was problematic um, because what it meant was that Joyce was not writing a book for the likes of the, the New York Society for the S Suppression of Vice. He was writing a book for people who didn't care whether the sensibilities of the, of the vice squad were 
um, could understand it or not. And it's sort of like, um, I think it's if you've ever been in a country where you don't speak the language and you're walking down the street um, and suddenly you walk past a group of people and they all burst into laughter. It's an extremely uncomfortable feeling, right? Not to understand, not to be in on the joke, not to be in on what's being said and what's going on. So I think a lot of the um, outrage at the incomprehensibility of things like Joyce's Ulysses was actually outrage at anyone daring to speak a different language um, than the language of the elites. Um, in this case, the language of high modernism. Mm, very interesting. I think in your answers, you're demonstrating something that uh, you did really well in the book that I wanted to ask you about, which is the combination of going into the cases in detail, right? We really do understand the specific cultural issues in France around the Impressionists that are different than the gender concerns in England around the Bronte sisters, right? We're in a different country. We're a few decades separate. But there's also patterns between these, right? Even if we're moving across the ocean, even if we're moving through time, even if we're moving different art forms, right? A novel is a pretty different art form from a ballet, from a painting. But there are a lot of patterns that you found, and you've given us a few of them so far. I'm wondering if you can tell us about any other patterns you found when comparing these different instances of outrage. Right. Well, one of the things I tried to do was really situate each of these cases in the particular place and time um, that it arose, because I think that's, that's actually crucial for understanding. I think if the Bronte's novels had been published, you know, in France in 1972, they wouldn't have caused any outrage. Um, but they weren't. They were published in England in, in 1847. And so um, I tried to really put them in their particular place. But you're right, things came up over and over again. Um, and certainly one of the key patterns was the attack on social hierarchy. These traditional hierarchies were just starting to break down. And we know that because of the political revolutions and the industrial revolutions, that was that was happening. Things were, were really changing. Um, and my argument is that the, this these cultural productions were both a response to that and by breaking down hegemonic ideas furthered those those changes. But that was a big one, attack on social hierarchy, whether it's a gender hierarchy, a racial hierarchy, class hierarchy, hierarchy around sexuality. Um, I think that that is a huge pattern. I think another huge pattern is about identity, really opening up possibilities for identity. And I think that's a, that is probably the key contribution that I see that all of these works of art gave towards this emerging modernity was open up possibilities for for other ways of being in the world, for more um, nuanced ways of being in the world, for non-traditional ways of being in the world. So we see something like Václav Nijinsky in the Ballet Russe being a um, hundred years ago, what we now would call gender fluid, right? Non-binary. Um, and not having a problem with it. It's like, yeah, I'm not I'm neither feminine nor masculine in their traditional senses. I'm both and neither and something more. And I think that that opening up possibilities for identity um, is one of the key things um, that I found. And, and finally, the third big pattern I think is really important is, is these were um, all of these things, we really see this separation of traditional morality from art, that art comes into its own in a way in allowing in being allowed to be separate from morality. And that was a huge battle. That was one of the battles. And over and over again, we see questions, critics asking, should this be allowed to exist? We even see um, Charlotte Bronte, who may have burned, um, there's, there's some evidence that um, Emily Bronte wrote a second novel. And it's possible that after her death, Charlotte burned it because we see Charlotte, who was left on her own after, you know, all of her siblings had passed away, was left on her own to sort of fend off these attacks, um, really withdrawing and, and saying, I'm not sure such a character as Heathcliff ever should have been written. She doesn't know whether it, it ever should have been done um, because it does separate this sort of traditional morality from the needs of art. And so throughout this time period, we see over and over again, um, Emily Dickinson is attacked 
because she refuses to follow the rules, the rules of art making, um, and instead follows her own internal set of rules. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's a huge pattern I saw that happened over and over again. Hmm. I'd love to ask you um, a little bit more detail about some of the cases. Unfortunately, uh, I don't think we're going to be able to go into all of them in this much detail. But as you started um, at the beginning with kind of picking the Emily Dickinson book off the shelf, um, as you said, there was a lot of outrage. Today, that seems kind of surprising. And you've just mentioned sort of that the outrage was she wasn't following the rules. She kind of chose not to. But the complication that I wasn't really fully aware of until I read this was that she did not publish her poems in her lifetime. They were published after her death. And the people that published them on her behalf were really trying not to provoke outrage, <laughs> yeah. right? It's not like they weren't like the Impressionists who were doing it all on purpose. They really tried not to have the reaction. And yet, clearly, that didn't work that well. So. <laughs> right. How did they try and avoid this outcome and why didn't their efforts, because they really did try, why didn't that work? Um, so the interesting thing about Emily Dickinson is how incredibly transgressive she was um, in her poetry by issuing these traditional forms. So we see lots of critics saying, oh my God, you would think that she would be able to come up with a rhyme, all, all these poems and nothing rhymes. <laughs> I'm not sort of getting that, yeah, that's a new thing. Um, but also in her life, Emily Dickinson was quite transgressive. Um, and one of the ways she was transgressive was was uh, doing something that many male authors have done without comment, which is take time for her work for herself and not fritter away all of her life doing the things that an upper class New England spinster woman would have been expected to do, visiting the neighbors um, and, 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 um, and helping with with charity work, and uh, all the you know sitting in church and doing all the things that a nice woman was supposed to do. She didn't do that. She chose not to do it, um, and she chose instead to actually spend time with her writing. And she had to fight for that time. She had to fight for the time to do it. Um, but the other thing that we often Mis have a misconception about Emily Dickinson. She didn't see anyone. Um, that's not true. She saw the people she wanted to see. And her sister, Lavinia, said, you know, Emily was always looking for an interesting new person to come along. There just weren't that many of them. Um, but one person that she had a really intense relationship was actually her sister-in-law, Susan. Um, and their debates, this is an enormous debate, whether the two of them were, were lovers or not, and what exactly that means. Um, but it certainly true that it was an intense relationship. It was a lifelong relationship. It was a passionate relationship. Um, and Emily wrote uh, letters to Susan that survived that certainly seemed to be the letters um, of a passionate lover. Um, but the the after Emily's death, um, her sister-in-law, Sue's husband, Austin, who was Emily's brother, and his his mistress, um, Mabel Loomis Todd, are the ones who ended up uh, publishing Emily's poems, sort of getting their hands on them, and some devious things happened there. Um, and Mabel Loomis Todd was going to become famous doing this, and she knew that. Um, so she was really doing it. But she also wanted to erase Sue from Emily's life and erase any hint of lesbianism in Emily Dickinson, fearing that that would be too much for the public to take. So she erased, you know, she published a volume of letters um, from Emily and took out all the letters from to Sue. Um, Sue was her chief correspondent. Oh, there are more letters to Sue than to anyone else, but they don't appear in that first um, version of the letters. Pronouns were changed, so it seemed like some very beautiful poems written written to a, a woman, probably Sue, were written to a man. Um, and then there was this idea that came out that everyone who knew Emily said, this is just not true. This is just not true. It never happened. But the idea that some man had broken her heart and that's why she had was this recluse. Um, and everyone who knew her said, no, no, no man broke her heart. Didn't happen. Um, but so there, it's a, still a huge debate um, in among Dickinson scholars uh, that, that 
what exactly was the relationship between Emily and Sue. But so the so Mabel and Miss Todd really wanted to clean this up and take any hint of sexuality out of these poems, some of which are are really it's like that's quite a trick to take some sexuality out of that. Um but they're they're um that that had to be removed. And the idea was Mabel Loomis Todd was going to make this into a publishing phenomenon. But in order to do that, she created this myth of this, you know, very innocent, always dressed in white, completely asexual, completely reclusive, withdrawn little woman who was so shy that she couldn't talk to anyone unless she had her back turned to them. Um, and that was that was to sell these poems, right? Because it was just weird enough that it would pique the interest of the public without getting into the really transgressive part of Emily's life, which was she was a woman in a lifelong relationship with another woman who took time to make her art. She was a conscious artist um, who reworked her poems over and over again. And instead she was presented, oh, these are just scribblings that she jotted down and she didn't know what she was doing and she wasn't very educated and she had no idea what she was up to. And she was really presented as a child, um, not a conscious artist. And that is how that's still a lot of the mythology around her is this sort of childlike, innocent being, which completely erases all of her artistry, all of her education. She was extremely well educated for a woman of her time. Um, all the craft she put into these poems, and it erases Sue from her life. Um, by doing that, though, by making this sort of weird enough, but not really subversive persona for Emily. Unfortunately, um, it delegitimated her in the eyes of the critics. How dare this woman who is so uneducated and so childlike and so reclusive, how dare she write these poems that nevertheless, despite the fact that that Sue also, uh, I'm sorry, that Mabel Loomis Todd also rewrote some of the poems and gave them trite little titles, even though she'd done that, the power of the poems still comes through. And that because Emily had been sort of constructed as this as this baby, um, that was even more offensive to the critics than if it had been someone who claimed their power. Um, she was not allowed to claim her power um, because that would have been, in in Mabel Loomis Todd's opinion, that would have been too subversive. Um, so she was really watered down, but the power of the poems comes through and the fact that such strong poems were coming from such a weak woman was one of the things. So we have, you know, people saying in, um, in reviews, Oh, she writes like a born idiot. Um, and, and also saying, how dare she, how dare this woman do such a thing? Who does she think she is? So despite massive contortions, um, outrage, nevertheless, outrage, oh, nevertheless, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd love to ask about one where um, the potential for outrage perhaps is slightly more obvious. Um, you've already mentioned uh, Nijinsky and Ballet Russe and just how kind of, yep, gender, male, female, all the things. Um, and that was not hidden, right? That was not subtle. Absolutely and not. And in some ways, yeah. And in some ways, it's kind of easy to assume that we know today why that would cause outrage 100 years ago. This is, I think, one of the instances where the fact that you do put the cases in such context is really important because some of the reasons are maybe what we assume, but not all of them. So why was gender presentation in Ballet Russe productions, the kind of public personas of the dancers, why did this touch such a nerve in this time and place? <laughs> right. So I really think we have to look at France at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, and we have to see what's been going on there. Um, and I think a really important point is there's been the Franco-Prussian War and France lost. Um, and it lost in a, in a very swift and humiliating defeat. Um, that was immediately followed by the Paris Commune. Um, and there was this feeling that um, there was a real fear of invasion. There was a lot of xenophobia in France at the time. Um, this was tied, of course, to the to the Dreyfus affair, right? There was all this anti-Semitism and this feeling that, um, and I, I make the argument that a lot of this is tied to feelings of traditional masculinity, that traditional masculinity in France um, had was weakened. It was under attack, that men in France were not as manly as the Prussians who'd come in and beat us, or Whereas the Russians who were coming in with a form ballet that the French considered 
particularly their own, their own national form. And that now the Russians are taking it over and the Russians are doing better. Um, and so there was a, a real fear about masculinity. It was also at a time of enormous anti-Semitism in France. The Dreyfus Affair went on for 10 years, really dividing the country into pro and anti camps. Um, and a lot of that had to do with anti-Semitism. Um, so there was, so the Ballet Russe came in um, being uh, tied very strongly to the Jewish community, um, being foreigners, being Russian, and being um, a, the toast of Paris when they arrived, absolutely the toast of Paris, changing everything. They were the hot ticket of the time. But also Nijinsky and Diaghilev, um, the, the impresario of the Ballet Russe, were out queer men. They did not hide the fact at all that they were lovers. It was not, it was not a, um, a source of shame for them at all. They just didn't bother to hide this. Um, it was one of the reasons they were in Paris in the first place is because the anti-sodomy laws didn't exist in Paris at the time as they did in many other countries. So they could, they could do things in Paris. They could get away with things in Paris that they couldn't yet. But those anti-sodomy laws were on the way. They were coming. Um, as, you know, uh, I think the queer community in Paris had sort of been flying under the radar for a while, but, but, um, certainly that, that crackdown was coming and certainly French society was not, um, without homophobia. That was certainly true. But to have Nijinsky come in as a dancer, he was so powerful. He was so athletic. And at the same time, he was graceful. He was, um, he was really gender bending. He was queer in the 21st century century way. Um, so that this was really f- uh, touched a nerve in France about masculinity. Who is the who is the stronger man here, this guy who can jump and seems to actually literally hang in the air, this incredibly powerful athlete who's doing these in- incredible physical feats. And at the same time, he's doing doing them dressed in a in a, you know, pink body stocking covered with rose petals. Um, and he's he's not hiding the fact that he's queer. And so that really led to this backlash. Who are these people? They're invading us. Um, there were fears about, about this foreign sexuality um, that's coming there. But it, I think it was really tied to politically also what was going on in France. When we get um, the riot at the opening of the Rite of Spring, it's also on the eve of World War I, right? So those fears of invasion are, are not coming out of the thin air, right? <laughs> um, uh, World War I is about to happen, in fact. Um, but I think we can see that the outrage, the riot, the famous riot at the right, um, wasn't so much about the dances that everything that the Ballet Russe represented. And I think you know, one of the reasons we sort of know that is the riot started before the ballet did, you know, before the curtain was up, people were already shouting and making noises um, in the in the audience. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why I stuck with England, France, and the United States, because I really thought it was important to put the cases I chose into the real social, political, economic context. So I could write about things like the rise of department stores um, in France in the middle of the 1800s and how that interacted with how the Impressionists were perceived, or uh, the Dreyfus case um, in France and how that affected feelings around anti-Semitism. Um, where I could, t- I had enough cultural knowledge, and of course looked at more um, to sort of say, oh, what's the context here? What are literacy rates like in England in 1848? That's an important thing to know. Speaking of important things to know, um, I'd love to talk a little bit more about Ulysses, um, yeah. because this was obviously not just about outrage in terms of critics, in terms of audience. There were some really clear legal ramifications, right? The government got really involved in this one. Um, so how did this particular legal battle kind of ripple outwards, right? Ripple outwards in terms of what counts as art, what's allowed, literally, legally, what's allowed, um, and also ripples kind of in time. What sorts of legacies do we still have from this one book and the legal battles around it? 
right? So Ulysses is fascinating because uh, Ulysses is published really where we're kind of at the height um, in the United States, certainly, of immigration from Europe. Uh, and so we see that immigrants are coming from especially Eastern and Southern Europe are coming into places like New York City. And this is causing an enormous amount of xenophobia um, because they're, they're going to carry all sorts of things with them, like subversive ideas, like, you know, anarchist ideas. Um, and there's just been the Russian Revolution, right? So who knows what, what is going to come in with these foreigners who were viewed with such suspicion, in, especially in New York City. Um, and we get the rise of the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, which was founded by a man named Anthony Comstock, who... Um, who is still in our lives today. I'll talk a little bit about the Comstock Act in just a minute. Um, but Anthony Comstock was was really xenophobic. He was really anti-immigrant. Um, he was he was very upset about the idea of sex. He didn't, he thought sex, he thought lust was the basis of everything bad in society. Um, he was opposed to birth control. He was obviously opposed to abortion. Um, he was, uh, he was very concerned that the pernicious ideas, uh, aroused by lust were going to leak into the minds of those, those innocent minds who were open to influence by which he meant um, women, children, and immigrants, and that they would get dangerous ideas, and that he was very concerned um, that women, especially these radical feminists, if they got the vote, they would oh, they would destroy the world. Um, that's what would happen, um, because they would want to do things like um, not be the property of their husband, but instead maybe have a job, or make their own decision about who they were going to marry, or their own decision about whether or not to have children, or how many children to, to have. And Comstock really saw that as the end of civilization as we know it. Um, so he had started the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, and he had enormous powers. Um, and one of his powers was, because he worked with the post office, he had the power to ban um, things going in the mail, such as information about birth control or the little magazines, which were the literary magazines where a lot of new writing um, was published. And um, the Little Review was, in fact, a New York literary magazine that was first first started serializing Ulysses as James Joyce was still writing it. Um, it was being serialized in the Little Review, which was published in Greenwich Village in New York by Margaret Anderson and Jane Heap, who were arrested um, through a complaint by the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice um, and taken to trial and actually could have done jail time. Um, they were fined, quite, quite a significant fine, but they escaped jail time. Um, and their lawyer, John Quinn, uh, said to them as they were going out of the courtroom, um, well, don't do that anymore. Don't publish anything more obscene. Um, and they said to him, how are we supposed to know if it's obscene? And he said, I'm sure I don't know, but just don't do it. Um, and so that it really came the the important point I think about Ulysses was it opened up this question: who gets to decide what is obscene? And the you know the concomitant question of that: who gets to decide what is art? But who gets to decide? Do the moral entrepreneurs like Anthony Comstock get to? to decide, or should it be left in the hands of, say, literary critics, or the public, or professors, or artists themselves? Who gets to decide what is art and what is pornography? Um, in the banning of Ulysses, so Ulysses was banned in the United States, um, and then later in, in um, England, uh, and it was burned. It was taken to the government incinerator and burned. Um, in the first round of trials, the moral entrepreneurs won. They got to say, we get to decide what is art and what is not art. In the beginning of the 1930s, uh, Bennett Cerf of Random House brought another case to trial, um, and and Ulysses was unbanned um, at that point. But partly that was because by that point, the Nazis had started burning books in Germany, and it was very uncomfortable uh, for uh, the United States and Britain to be burning books, the same books, in fact, um, that the Nazis were burning, because they were also burning Ulysses. Um, so, but the the I think one of the things that that question 
still reverberates today because the Comstock Act, the Comstock Act in the United States is the law that is currently being used now in 2023 in the United States to ban drag shows, to bring about book bans, um, to try to control information about birth control or abortion. That's all being done under the Comstock Act, which um, never left the books, is still there, which was there to prevent this sort of social upheaval, but also there to um, sort of stake a claim that the people who get decide what reading material that we will have or what viewing material we will have, who should it be? Um, and the sort of the New York Society for su- the Suppression of Vice says it should be the moral entrepreneurs. It should be the moralists rather than the artists or the scholars who make that decision. Um, so I was quite surprised to see um, as I was finishing up this book, just reading the newspaper, oh my gosh, look, it's the Comstock Act. It's still in the books and it's still being used today. And it's still the same question, who gets to decide um, what what books are in schoolrooms? So we have teachers in Florida, who've elementary school teachers, um, who've removed all of the books from their classrooms um, because they still have the same question that Margaret Anderson and Jane Heap had: How do we know if it's obscene or not? Um, obscene is a tricky thing to define. Um, and the and John Quinn said, "I'm sure I don't know, but don't do it." And we get the same thing: teachers and principals of schools saying, "How do we know whether this book is acceptable or?" not. There isn't anything to let us know. So we just better remove it all. We just better ban it all. Um, And so that's going on in the United States right now, so that there are no books in classrooms for the fear that some of these books will fall under this very vaguely defined thing, obscenity. Um, Same thing, you know, it's almost exactly 100 years ago, exactly the same thing. So that's obviously a really clear link between these six case studies and today, as you've demonstrated. Um, Are there any other legacies or lineages that you think we can trace from the outrage in your book to what's happening today? Um, That's really clear when I think we, you know, the question of what is art and who gets to decide, I think is huge. Um, These cases come up. There was just uh, a case recently that's sort of near and dear to my heart. I live in Italy now and I'm just outside of Florence. Um, And there was a case where a school principal was given the choice between being fired or resigning um, because students in an art class studying the Renaissance were shown a picture of Michelangelo's sculpture of the David Um, And it it caused such outrage uh, that she lost her job, although happily the the mayor of Florence invited her for a trip here. So she's just been to visit and see David in person um, and said, you know, it's magnificent. But um, I think we see the culture wars. uh, My one of the reasons I wrote this book was because I was reading all this stuff just because I really enjoyed reading about it. Um, And I kept seeing these culture wars come up over and over again. And people saying, oh, this is terrible. It's never happened before. And um, I thought, well, actually, you know, it has, it has happened before. So we see, you know, still today, uh, female authors taking male pen names as the Brontes did because they're afraid if they if they publish under a um, under a female sounding name that they won't be taken very seriously and I think we see uh, a, a, quite frankly an uproar whenever there are big literary awards who who is taken seriously, who is not, what is considered real literature. And a lot of that has to do with not just um, what it's about, but who wrote it, who made it. So I actually had one of my students did a really brilliant senior thesis where she looked at the words movie critics to use to describe movies. um, And she did an analysis of the movies. And what she found was that um, if the movie is directed by a woman, the word sweet was used over and over again. The, the, it may have murders in it. It may have all sorts of uh, tragedies in it, but it's considered sweet. If that was the word sweet, if it's, if it's, um, if it's produced by a woman, we, you know, the same thing was true of Zora Neale Hurston. It's like people said, Oh, this has no, the, the eye, their eyes were watching God as a story. You know, it's a love story and, and it doesn't ever tackle real issues. 
It tackles really serious issues, things like rape and domestic violence um, all over the place. But, you know, poverty, oppression, um, the, the women's lives in marriage, what happens to them. But because it was written by a woman over and over again, it's like, oh, it's a sweet little lightweight story. It's like, did you miss the part about the rape? <laughs> okay. Um, it's not a sweet little lightweight story. It's a really profound story. But a woman wrote it, so it must not be very important. We see that in controversies about about literary awards that happen all the time now. Unfortunately, we do. Um, but at least this book helps with the idea of this is new. This has never happened before. <laughs> no, actually, we can see it <laughs> thanks to your work. Um, so that leaves me only with my final question, which is uh, the book is available. It's out for people to read. Is there anything, whether or not it's a book, whether or not it's on this exact topic that you're working on next, you'd like to share with us? <laughs> well, actually, I've just I've just recently retired and moved to Italy. My husband is an Italian citizen, so I live in oh, a... that's true. So enjoying your life I'm is a legitimate answer? But I'm also, um, I'm writing a murder mystery. <laughs> <laughs> because if you live in a really small town, um, that you see plenty of this going on, um, and I think that uh, I think it would make a fascinating setting for. So I'm I'm giving it a whirl. I'm giving it a whirl, a murder mystery, but that's just a tiny little uh, baby bird that is not ready to fly yet. So we'll see what happens there. Fair enough. Well, very intriguing. Um, and while you are off investigating the possibilities of a murder mystery, uh, of course, listeners can read the book we've been discussing titled Outrage, The Arts and the Creation of Modernity from Stanford University Press. Kathy, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed our talk.